On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT. After 10 consecutive hikes, as expected, the Federal Reserve has decided to pause, but is signaling that two more increases are likely this year as it continues to battle high inflation. Now, this move leaves the benchmark rate at a range of 5 to 5.25 percent, and it's the first time that the central bank has not raised its federal funds rate since January of 2022. But Fed Chair Jerome Powell did stress that the central bank is committed to fighting inflation and that it is not done yet. In light of how far we've come in tightening policy, the uncertain lags with which monetary policy affects the economy, and potential headwinds from credit tightening, today we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Looking ahead, nearly all committee participants view it as likely that some further rate increases will be appropriate this year to bring inflation down to 2% over time. We remain committed to bring inflation, bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below-trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. As for a potential pivot or rate cut, Fed Chair Powell said that he does not see that happening for a couple of years until inflation comes down significantly. It will be appropriate to cut rates at such time as inflation is coming down really significantly. And again, we're talking about a couple years out. I think, as anyone can see, not a single person on the committee wrote down a rate cut this year, nor do I think it is uh, at all likely to be appropriate. If you Joining us to discuss and analyze the latest from the Fed, what it means for inflation, the economy and the markets is Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Hankey served on President Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. He's advised numerous governments on the adoption of currency boards and, of course, is a fan favorite here on Kitco. Professor, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to Kitco News. Good to be with you, Michelle. Great to have you. All right, let's dissect this, Professor Hanke. As expected, the Fed paused, but the more surprising aspect of the decision came with a dot plot where the individual members of the FOMC indicate their expectations for rates further out. And the median expectation there is for a funds rate of 5.6% by the end of 2023. Now, assuming the committee moves in quarter point increments, that would be two more hikes over the remaining four meetings this year. So this has been called a hawkish pause, if you will. And perhaps more significantly is what the Fed chair is telling the markets, and that is to not expect a pivot. So what is your overall reaction to what we heard from Fed Chair Powell today, Professor? Well, I think the first thing that's important, uh, he's, he did mention one thing that uh, is, I think, quite important, and that is he said that the quantitative tightening uh, will continue. That is the shrinkage of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the contribution of the Fed to the money supply will be basically negative. And that's really the important thing, because if I can quote here, Milton Friedman, Dean of the Quantity Theory of Money in the Monetarist School, Milton Friedman said, monetary policy is not about interest rates. It's about the growth in the quantity of money. And notice that Paul was talking always about interest rates and where the interest rates are going. Those are somewhat unimportant. I know the market and everybody is focused on it because that's what the Fed tells them to focus on. But if we look at those and look at the market, by the way, it looks like their market's pricing in about a 62% probability that in the July 26th meeting, the Open Market Committee will be another 25 basis point increase in Fed funds rate. So where, where we're set is that the Fed funds rate probably will go up the next open uh, Fed uh, uh, meeting, 
and we will also continue with quantitative tightening. Now, this is this is bad news because the Fed, if we look at the money supply, which is what we really should be looking at, the money supply is contracting. Since last April, the money supply has actually shrunk by 4.6%. Now, that's that we have to go back to 1938. 1939 to find that kind of shrinkage. When you get shrinkage and big changes in the money supply, whether they're shrinkages or accelerations, you, you then get the transmission of those changes going through the economy. And within about one to six months, you get changes in sensitive asset price. And then if we go out further, six to 18 months, you get changes in economic activity. And if you go out another 12 to 24 months, you get changes in broad-based inflation. So what, what we've seen here is that since the money supply peaked out, actually in July, the money supply has been crashing. And, and what does that mean? That means the economy is going to be crashing. And look at, look at inflation, Michelle. We have the new headline CPI number just came out, and that's down at what four percent? That's we're going down. He's talking about as if inflation is is stuck and not going anyplace. It's been it's been falling like a stone. The producer price index just came out today, and the year over year change is only one point one percent. So, inflation is falling very rapidly because the money supply has been contracting very rapidly. And eventually we're going to have the economy contracting very rapidly. So that's that's kind of the general overview as I see it. They're not looking at the money supply. They're ignoring the money supply. They're only talking about interest rates. Okay, they held them this time. They're probably going to increase them a little bit the next meeting in July that they have. And in the meantime, they're going to continue to shrink the balance sheet of the Fed with quantitative tightening. So that simply means the money supply is going to keep going, going south on us. And of course, it's also interesting to see what will happen with additional quantitative tightening as the Treasury starts to issue debt and fill up the Treasury general account. But before we unpack that, you have long said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, just like Milton Friedman says. Uh, let's talk about inflation first before we hit on the impending recession, which I believe you are projecting. So inflation has been cooling, as you quite rightly said, May CPI coming in at 4% year over year, still double the Fed's target. You called that correctly a while ago. Uh, you said that inflation would be running at between 2 and 5% by year end. So where do you see inflation by your end now. Well, I, I'm still holding to that range that John Greenwood and I uh, developed, the 2 to 5%, but it's going to be closer to the 2% number than the 5% number. It's going to be down on the lo lower side of that broad range that we anticipated back in February, by the way. We're using the quantity theory of money, and what we really... Uh, are looking at very carefully is is just how fast the money supply is decelerating. It's it's really we haven't seen this again since 1938-39. This is it's really extraordinary, and and it's extraordinary because the Fed just ignores it. <laughs> So, uh, Professor, as you quite rightly point out, the M2 percentage growth rate has become negative year over year. And as you just said, the last time that happened was just before the Great Depression. So what are your expectations for a recession then? What would that look like? How soon can we get it? How deep and ugly would it be? I, th I think a, a recession is baked in the cake, given these money supply contractions that we're experiencing now. Because re remember, the, the lag you have between ch big changes in the money supply and changes of economic activity, you've got a window of about 6 to 18 months, Michelle. And, and what do we have? We, we, we're 
J- July of last year, we had the peak and the money supply is falling ever since then. So we're 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 kind of in the, in the zone right now where we could see some significant softening start, and I think we'll be really into it by the first quarter of next year. That's what it's looking like to me. And and as I say, these things are really baked in the cake because you look at the changes in the money supply and and the typical lags that occur between changes in the money supply and changes in it in asset prices, sensitive commodity prices, and then economic activity, and then ultimately inflation. So so why is the Fed why is the Fed not taking this into account then? Why is the Fed ignoring the money supply, as you say there have been. I, I think the Fed doesn't know what it's doing. Remember, they they have doubled down on this money supply business. They, Chairman Powell has repeatedly said in public, the Fed doesn't pay any attention to the money supply because the money supply is not a reliable indicator. Changes in the money supply are not reliable indicators or of changes in economic activity and inflation. He said this over and over again. Well, I looked at 147 countries. I just finished this work. 147 countries, and I've looked at the changes in the money supply and changes in inflation since 1990. And... What do you get? You almost get a one-to-one relationship. You get a correlation coefficient of about 0.93, but one, a perfect relationship. You change a money supply and you get a proportional change in the price level. So they're ignoring that. They're ignoring that evidence and they're ignoring monetarism and the quantity theory of money. And the reason they're doing this is probably many reasons, but one is that the models that they have are post-Keynesian economic models, macroeconomic models that don't include money. Money is not included in those post-Keynesian models. So that that that's one reason. If you if you have a model that doesn't include money, you ignore money. It's pretty simple. Uh, simple. Monitor it. What's it, what's in the model? What's in the model is money. As simple and very disconcerting that the Fed is dismissing this. So seeing as you say they're not paying attention to the money supply, and seeing as we have additional concerns of a liquidity drain as the Treasury fills up its Treasury general account, I mean, it's expected to suck up about a trillion dollars from the economy by the end of Q3. And people are saying that that will act like a sudden burst of quantitative tightening as well. So what kind of recession then are you anticipating in the first quarter of 2024? I mean, paint me a picture of what that looks like if we have a Fed that's not paying attention to the right things, as you say it is. Well, if they let's let's look at the the, the money supply. What, 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 what's the, what are the sources of the money supply? Well, the big source is commercial banks. Uh, about 82.5% of the money supply measured by M2 is deposits in banks. And, and deposits in banks are created by banks extending credit. Now, that aspect has been growing positively and contributing to a positive aspect or growth component to M2 but it's been slowing down very rapidly and, and, and it's slowed considerably since the Silicon Valley banking crisis that we had a few months back. So you have the commercial bank contribution slowing down very, very rapidly and the contribution of the Fed is negative. They're, they're shrinking their balance sheet. So they're not contributing anything. They're, they're, they're actually draining things out of the system. And now... We have, as you mentioned, the, the, the Treasury in, into the picture. And what that means is that the negative aspect of the money supply growth looks like it's going to continue. And if it does continue, that gets to your question, Michelle. 
what what's the recession going to look like? It's going to look pretty ugly. If, if they keep doing what they're doing right now, which it looks like they will, they will not pivot, then I think the recession will be quite ugly, and, and we can anticipate the ugliness starting no later than the first quarter of next year. Now, they the only thing that could make them pivot is if they have some kind of credit or liquidity crash or squeeze on Wall Street. That that might cause them to pivot because the Fed is very data dependent. They they watch current data. They keep their eye on current data. And if a liquidity squeeze raises its ugly head on Wall Street, they they will pivot pretty fast. Now when you say pivot, do you mean a pivot on rate increases and cutting rates, or do you mean a pivot on the quantitative tightening side? Both. Well, both. They probably would do the rates first, but the the quantitative tightening, they might might call it a day on that and and, uh, stop the quantitative tightening too. But I I see what's going on in the financial markets on Wall Street, if if that became chaotic and and, and a a big credit crunch, as they call it, then the Fed might pivot. Barring that kind of situation and panic on Wall Street, I do not think they'll pivot. I think they're just going to continue down the same road they've been on, flying blind, not paying any attention to the money supply. And and that that means that the recession is going to be ugly, not, not, not a mild one, but a, an ugly one. How prolonged would you see this recession being? Uh, if it starts to kick in in the first quarter of next year and the Fed by then catches a wake up? Well, we, I, 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 really, I really don't know. It depends on what they do with what, what's, what's happening to the monetary policy. Uh, let, let's say uh, a, a, a year in advance of of whatever date you're looking at economic activity, roughly, because it, uh, more or less got a, that six to 18 month lag between changes in the money supply and changes in economic activity. And th- this is what makes it tricky for people because they look at what's going on in the money supply right now, but, th- but they don't, an- they're not thinking about the lags that come in. I mean, even Powell said, Repeatedly in his comments today, that there are lags between there's a money, not money supply, monetary policy. He, he called it monetary policy, but it's really the money supply, and those lags uh, for economic activity six to eighteen months. So, just back of the envelope, about a, about a year. Look, for first of January. 2023, look what was happening then to the money supply. Well, it hadn't really started slowing down too much, but and then it started slowing quite rapidly in April and came up a little bit, and then and then since July of last year has just been headed south. So you can you can look at the pattern and put a pencil to a piece of paper and kind of make your own judgment about how, how long the thing is going to last. So uh, just to clarify and to summarize what you're saying, then you expect inflation to come down by the end of the year as the Fed continues on this path. But that's eventually we're going to lead us into a recession on eventually. You're saying that's sort of inevitable at this point anyway, that we're going to have a recession in the first quarter of next year. And that will only be exacerbated by the Treasury, which now has to fill up its Treasury general account now that the debt ceiling has been raised and essentially create more of a liquidity crunch as it issues new debt. Is that safe to say? Inflation will be tackled, but expect a recession. Yes, I, I think I think that's exactly what's happening. And, and the Fed, is, you see, by not looking at the money supply, they're kind of looking at the, this current data and they're, they're looking at at, at lagging indicators, for example, let, let me give you two lagging indicators that they're looking at. They're focused very clearly on the labor market. Well, that's a lagging indicator. That's that that that, that doesn't 
uh, give you a lead on what's going to happen to the economy. The other lagging indicator that they're looking at, they, they look at this core uh, price index or consumer price index. And, and and the core is is a is a lagging indicator. The the thing that comes before when you look at prices are the producer prices. They change first. And then the headline consumer price index changes. And, and, and the thing that slowly changes behind the producer price index and the consumer price index is is this core index that the Fed keeps their eye on. So they're behind the eight ball on that too. So so the, right now, if they look at the economy, what, what, what do they do? They, they say, well, the labor market still looks pretty hot, looks pretty good. And our preferred measure, our core measure, uh, the price index is not coming down very fast. So we got to stay tight. We got to stay tight. That, that's, that's their view. And that's exactly what Paul said today. They're they're going to stay tight, and they probably will tight some more. He said in July. Yes, expectations are, as you just mentioned, for a 25 basis point increase in July. And as you touched on, Professor, we have had three of the four largest bank collapses in U.S. history since March this year, and there has been concern about the impact of another rate hike and further tightening on the banking system. And today Powell said that that is in fact one of the reasons that they've decided to pause and evaluate because they're also watching to see the impact on the banks. He said that they don't know the full extent of the unfolding banking crisis as yet. And that is quite a stock change from his prior statement where he said the banking system is sound and resilient. We haven't really, we don't know the full extent of, of the consequences of the banking turmoil that we've seen. We, we, it would be early to see those, but we don't know what the extent is. We'll have some more time to see that unfold. I mean, it's, a, it's just the idea that we're trying to get this right. Right. So they're trying to get that right. That is definitely a big change from the conviction that he seemed to portray in his prior statement after the last meeting where he said the banking system was, quote, sound and resilient. So what do you make of that, Professor? What is your outlook on the banking system if the Fed does continue its current course? Well, I think the, the, the cr- growth in credit will, will wither away to almost nothing. It, it is very slow right now, by the way. It's, it's been declining. It was up in, in low, you know, a little over 10, 11, 12% year over year. And and now the growth rate is is declined. I haven't looked at it in in the last few days, but it's the year over year has declined to I think around three percent, which is it's still contributing something to the growth in the money supply, or but not not very much. And 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 probably the Fed is hearing from the bankers that they're tightening up. the The banks are are tightening up, and part of that, by the way has been kind of a pro-cyclical policy in, imposed by Washington and the bank regulators because of, after Silicon Valley and the collapse of those three banks, the, the regulators said, oh, we've got, to get, we've got to get tough. They've got to increase the capital asset ratios of the banks. they got to recapitalize the banks. Now, when they do that, that makes the banks pull in their horns and not extend credit because... There, there are two ways that you can increase a capital asset ratio. The, 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 the numerator is, is capital. They could, they could issue more stock, but they don't want to do that because that dilutes the shareholders that already pull stock. Or you can reduce the denominator, which is assets, which means that they, they pull in credit. And that's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're shrinking the asset base that they have so they can increase the capital asset ratios to, to meet the demands of the regulators. Now, this is, this is pro-cyclical monetary policy. The regulators are imposing pro-cyclical monetary policies because they're forcing the banks to increase their capital asset ratios, recapitalize, and when they do that, the banks tighten up. They get, they get more stingy with credit, and that's exactly what they're doing. And when they do that, 
their contribution to the growth in the money supply, of course, is less and less all the time. And, and it's going literally to zero. I mean, pretty soon the banks the banks are going to have any, a, a net contribution to the money supply of zero. Well, what does that mean then in terms of a potential further collapse in the banking system, especially when you bring commercial real estate into the equation, because that's been hailed as the next shoe to drop. We've had warnings about that from Elon Musk to Charlie, to Charlie Munger to Janet Yellen. Powell also indicated that he is actually watching what's happening in the commercial real estate sector. We've got a lot of regional banks having exposure there. They can see rates in commercial real estate being high across the country. So do you see commercial real estate then leading to another bank collapse? Well, uh, that that that's uh, yes, potentially. But what what you're really saying, what you outlined very clearly there, is that we talked about a, a credit. Remember, I said credit crunch. There's a possibility of a credit crunch on Wall Street, and and that's kind of what you're outlining. If if that scenario you enunciated went forward. We might have a credit crunch on Wall Street, and, and that is significant for the Fed because that's probably the only thing that would force them to pit and, and loosen up, stop quantitative tightening, and maybe lower the Fed funds rate. So, so it's that credit crunch around the banking system, and, and you have the, of course, the commercial real estate has, has already been giving them a, a tremendous headache. Uh, 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 the in the banks uh, and you know what what you said maybe maybe be if that comes to fruition we will have a credit crunch and and if we do I think they will pivot. But what does that credit crunch look like? Does that mean another bank collapses? What does it actually look like in terms of the way it manifests itself, not just on Wall Street but also on Main Street? Well, uh, on on Main Street, it, mean, it means that you can't get credit. That's what a credit card. Which, which, by the way, on Main Street, like right simplify now, that for hard. our viewers. Uh, what does that mean? You can't get a loan. Simplify that for our viewers. I mean, we know it's harder to get a mortgage. You, you just you, you you just can't get a loan, and 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 and, it, and it's tougher to get a mortgage. That it's it, the 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 credit evaluations are more stringent and so it's it's just harder to get credit than, than it was and a, and a credit crunch means that it's it's really hard to get credit it's you, you you've got to be top flight credit to to receive credit and and the banks by the way not only we're talking about not extending new loans making it tougher for people to get new loans but they, they, they will pull in their credit lines and, and, and basically cut you off. Or they won't renew a revolving credit that you might have. So it's just tougher all, all the way around to get, to get your hands on credit. And, and in a credit crunch, it's, it's really tough. So to push home the point, you think it's likely that we will see another regional bank collapse? I I won't put any probability. I'm not predicting that that we will. Although, keep in mind, once you go into a recession, things and, and especially if the recession is fairly ugly, that that makes things tough on banks. So, you know, that's that's without giving you saying yes, there's going to be another bank failure. I'm not saying that. I'm not even giving you a probability. I'm just saying. The weather is going to get stormier and stormier for banks, Michelle. If you have if you have this recession, that that is part of the fallout you get with a recession. You you get people in a corner. So, Professor, despite all of this, the markets have been on on a tear this year, despite predictions to the contrary. At what point do you see the sentiment? impacting the equity markets and uh, not just the sentiment the credit crunch in reality at what point do you see the markets uh turning around uh well 
when the market participants wake up to let's start watching the money supply. They, they, they've been drinking the Kool-Aid that's been served up to them by the Fed. And, and if you read the newspapers, for example, it's incredible. Every single day, it's, it's just Fed speak. The, the, the newspaper reporters, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, they simply repeat what the Fed tells them. So they're, they're, they're not talking about uh, the money supply. They're not talking about the fact that it isn't interest rates. It's changes in the money supply that, that give you the tenor and tone for monetary policy. You don't read that in the paper. But, but they'll wake up again with these lagging indicators like the labor market. When the labor market's going south and we start getting some weaker and weaker numbers in the real economy, I think the market will uh, wake up and, and, and suffer. By the way, the market, the breadth in the market is not good at all. The market, you say the market's been on a tear. Well, it's been on a tear because you have a handful of stocks that have been on a tear. But in general, it's the breadth is it's, it's really not there at all. Yeah, that's fair. A lot of the activity to the upside has been concentrated on a number of stocks, certainly a number of the big uh, tech players and, uh, you know, NVIDIA <laughs> sort of pulling up the market itself as an AI play there. Professor, I want to get your thoughts, of course, on the gold market. Uh, the gold market was flat, as uh, Jerome Powell was explaining the central bank's decisions here. Uh, what, what's your outlook for gold then? Well, uh, number one, I'm I, bullish on gold, and the reason for that, gold does very well going into a recession. So that's that's the fundamentals. But but what I'm looking at with with Abe Kaufness, we've developed something called the Abe Kaufness uh, Gold Index, Gold Sentiment Index, Gold Sentiment Index, and what we do every thirty. Every hour, we look at all the articles that have been written on gold, and we do what's called text mining. We we look at the words in those articles. The computer does it, of course. We're not reading all the articles. And and we determine whether those articles are bullish or bearish. And we come up, using this high-frequency data, with a sentiment score. And and if the sentiments and and then from that sentiment score we've got algorithms that trade off from it, so we don't really care if the market is flat, if it's if it's going up or if it's going down, because let's say Michelle, the market is is going flat, it's going flat, nothing is happening for a whole year. It will fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down, and we're picking that sentiment up, and we're trading off from it, so. When the sentiment gets very bullish, we know that it will flip back and revert back to, to a neutral or bearish position of sentiment. And as a result, if we're long and, and the sentiment is very bullish, we want to get out of that long position and, and we want to go short because we know that the sentiment will be shifting back towards neutral and bearish. If it's very bearish, we want to get out of our short positions and go long because we know the sentiment's going to be swinging back the other way. Now, this is, this is high, based on high-frequency trading, and, and it, it's been profitable. Depending on the particular algorithm that we have hooked up to the sentiment index, We've been running around 30 to 50 percent uh, rate of return per annum on those high frequency trades. So, if the if the gold market is flat, I really don't care because there'll be a lot of volatility around it, and we are able to read with a hanky coughness gold sentiment index. So, so, so you're saying, so you're saying when the gold sentiment index is bullish, that's when you're looking to get out of a gold position. And if it's bearish, that's when you're looking to get into a gold position. So what is the hanky coffinous so, so what is the hanky coffinous gold sentiment index telling us today? Uh, the gold index is fairly bullish today. 
it's over in the it's over on the bullish side. Meaning meaning if you're long and you're this is now we're talking about very short term trading because we're measuring this sentiment index every hour, Michelle. So this this is very high frequency data. We're not talking about the fundamentals of gold, which I mentioned earlier. I'm fundamentally bullish, and the reason I'm fundamentally bullish is that gold does well in recessions, going into recessions. So, so that's one thing. And we also have a little bit of an outlier here because we've got a lot of talk coming out of the central banks and a lot of central bank buying. So that central bank buying is, is fundamentally bullish for gold. So those two things put together mean that I would want some gold in my portfolio long. The other, the sentiment index is is for very short-term trading off, off these zigs and zags, hour by hour, that occur when sentiment is changing in the market. So, so one thing is a fundamental long-term position. The other is a very short-term trading, opportunistic trading position where you're looking at hour-by-hour hour trades. Got it. So on the gold sentiment index, that's very short-term trading. When that indicates bullish, you say one should be bearish. But long-term, you're very bullish on gold. And as you mentioned, also given the fact that We've had central banks buying gold at record levels. We've also got this idea of the BRICS countries potentially looking to launch their own global reserve currency, potentially reportedly backed by a basket of commodities that would include gold. Given all that data, Professor, dare I ask you for a long-term price forecast for gold? I know you're not in the business of making price forecasts, but maybe I can get you to give one. Well, I, I yeah. Well, one thing on the short term, the, the Hanky Kaufman's gold sentiment score or in that that can go from very bearish to very bullish within a 24 hour period. So you're 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 just all, all over the place with that. The fundamentals you're asking, what what's my price prediction? I don't have one because I really don't trade that way. I, I just want to be long some gold. And and we'll uh, and we'll see how that evolves. <laughs> and and by the way, if if I decided to lighten up on my position, I would look at the Hanky Kaufman's Gold Sentiment Score to see exactly what my timing should be. And I, and I'd want to get out or lighten up a big long position if the sentiment score happened to be on that hour very bullish. You see. Where can we find the sentiment index? Where can our viewers find that? Okay. Okay. The, the sentiment index, you, you can find it by going to www.sentimentreport.com. www. Well, let me repeat that. I, I got a little bit mixed up myself. report. We will drop a link to that in the description of this video. As we wrap up, of course, you have a 50-year career as a global money doctor. You've advised heads of state and finance ministers from Indonesia to Kazakhstan, from Estonia to Ecuador. I believe you're currently working uh, with two presidential candidates in South America to quash inflation, both in Venezuela and in Argentina. Uh, let's talk about your work in Argentina, because obviously they've had extensive inflation hitting about 103 uh, percent in March, I believe. What are you advising to the candidates there in Argentina? I believe you're in consultation with the Libertarian Party candidate, Javier Millet. What are you telling him? What are you suggesting he do to tackle inflation there? Well, what 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 he has done uh, in the centerpiece of his campaign is he, he's basically dusted off something that I developed for President Menem in 1999, and that that's a dollarization plan in which you mothball the central bank in Buenos Aires and you mothball the peso and you put them both in a museum and you would replace the peso with the U.S. dollar. And 
it's called dollarization. And, and by the way, that's exactly what we did in 2000 and 2001 in Ecuador. That's dollarized. Uh, I also did it in Montenegro in 1999 when we replaced the hyperinflating Yugoslav dinar with a, with a Deutsch, mighty Deutschmark. So we dollarized Montenegro by, by replacing the dinar with a Deutschmark. And Malay wants to do that in Argentina. That's the only way to fix Argentina, by the way. Argentina has been plagued. It's the biggest debt deadbeat in the world. They've had five defaults since 1989. That's the largest number of any country in the world. And, and they have this endemic inflation that you mentioned. The dollarization would solve the whole thing immediately. And people are wise to this because people unofficially dollarized in Argentina. They, they like the greenback. They do this spontaneously and, and, and voluntarily. They want it official, so they find what Malay is proposing to be attractive, and, he, and he's running very well in the polls. He's doing very well. Someone's trying to get hold of you there, Professor. Uh, before I, I, I let you get there, if, if I... I've got a call coming in from Buenos Aires. All right. That's obviously a very important call as we're talking about uh, you helping them fight inflation there, so we'll take that as our cue. To wrap, still have a lot more questions for you, so we'll have to save them for next time. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Professor Steve Hanke. Thank you, Michelle. Great to be with you. Have a, have a good evening. All right. We'll see you again soon. And thank you, okay, as thanks. always. Thank you, Professor. Always a live and entertaining show here on On the Spot with Michelle McCory on Kitco News. Thank you all for watching. As always, a special thanks to our sponsors, Prime XBT and a reminder that there is a special offer for our viewers in the description. From me, Michelle McCory, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Begin your path to financial freedom. Gain up to a $7,000 bonus on us. Register and use promo code. Deposit and enjoy a 7% bonus. Available now. Link in the description.